dear friends, we are starting our Baku process virtual meeting. It, it's, uh, we dedicate this meeting for the Baku process initiated by the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan in 2008. We have um, very important people in our panel today. Uh, I would like to introduce them and then the minister will get the floor for welcoming remark. So we have Minister Abulfaz Karayev. He is the Minister of Culture of the Republic of Azerbaijan. We have Miguel Angel Maratinos. He is High Representative for the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. We have Dr. Salim Al-Malik. He is Director General of Islamic World Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, namely ISESCO. We have Anne, Anne Belinda Price. She is Chief of Section for Intercultural Dialogue of UNESCO. We have Jean-Christophe Pass as a moderator. He is Chief Executive Officer of an Executive Board, Chairman of Dialogue Civilization Research Institute. And we have Professor Mark Hardy. He is Professor of the Coventry University and Executive Director of Center for Peace, Trust and Social Relations of Coventry University. We have Robert Palmer. He, is, uh, he was Director of Culture and Cultural Natural Heritage of the Council of Europe and now director of Robert Palmer Consultants Company. We have Nihal Sahad, Chief of Cabinet and Spokesperson for the High Representative of the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. Professor Petty Mansouri is director of Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization of, and he's also UNESCO chairholder. And we have Deputy Minister Sevda Mamadaliva, she's Deputy Minister of Culture of Azerbaijan, Anar Karimov, Ambassador permanent delegate of Azerbaijan to UNESCO, and me, Vasile Vazade, I'm the deputy head of administration of the Ministry of Culture and head of International Cooperation and Innovation Department. So I would like to welcome you, to greet you in our virtual platform, the first time that we are meeting in a virtual format. So I will ask the minister to get his welcoming remark. Minister, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to greet uh, everyone and to express uh, the great uh, thanks on behalf of the government of Azerbaijan uh, for your very active participation in the Baku process, which was launched by His Excellency the President of Azerbaijan, Mr. Ilham Aliyev, uh, many years ago. And uh, we know the origin of this process. And I must note that every time president is noting that this process came from the idea of joining the activities of the ministers of cultures of uh, European countries and Islamic countries and bringing them to the common discussion and better understanding of the values of culture in the general development of the human being. And I think that this initiative was very strongly supported and all the institutions which are represented today. Additionally, I would like to note that World Tourism Organization later joined to this process. FAO joined this process, uh, project and uh, we are happy to have this cooperation during all these years. Uh, years. But uh, as you know that Baku process is uh, the activity which we have every second year while, when we accumulate the possibilities and views and positions of different people while having the common forum held in Baku. Uh, we are waiting for the next meeting of that. But in between that, uh, in between the forum uh, meeting itself, we have very dedicated uh, think tank work which regulates and forecasts the topics, the decisions, the ideas to be discussed at this next forum. And I'm thankful to all of you for very uh, dedicated approach to the work of this think tank. Most of you are participating at most of the meetings which we held uh, in Baku, in Paris, in London, in other places so I, and I think that uh, the value of such kind of meetings uh, are of great importance because we are guiding the line of the uh, cultural uh, understanding in the modern world bringing it to the discussion uh, in front of the uh, 
big auditorium, big media, uh, with the participation of the most valuable speakers and uh, personalities which we can achieve. And we're proud to have during all these years the leaders of international organizations like uh, UNESCO, like United Nations Alliance of Civilization, uh, like Council of Europe, uh, ICESCO, uh, World Tourism Organization, and other partners of the uh, forum. Today's meeting is the matter of the emergency. By all means, we had to have such kind of meeting to think about where to move, in which direction to bring the activity of the cultural assets uh, in our understanding uh, and for the entire world through passing through this very difficult time of the crisis. The crisis itself uh, brought us a lot of questions. And I think that uh, to find, to try to find the answers to these questions are of great importance for all of us, for every institution and for every uh, participants also. The crisis affected all kinds or all parts of the life. Every area is affected. And not only the matter of the limitation of the personal contacts, but it uh, brought a lot of problems concerning the uh, system of the usually used uh, facilities and vehicles which were bringing people together and putting them in the totally new uh, you know, environmental system. First of all, and I think that this is the biggest impact of this virus and this situation is going to the educational matters. How many high schools, how many uh, ordinary schools have been closed during this period of time, uh, minimizing the access to the personal teaching system but at the same time, it brought a wide range of the uh, virtual educational innovations and situations, which we can now uh, accept like a view for the future direction of the activity. The situation, the virus, the, uh, I mean, the influence of the virus, of the pandemia to the cultural institutions was also very unexpected and very interesting situation occurring there. All theaters, all cinema theaters, all big, I mean, uh, concert halls, all museums, all libraries, all cultural centers are closed. Our government, according to the decree of the president, subsidizes and goes further going further with the paying salary to all the people who came to this uh, difficult situation to keep them, you know, in the active position, but still keeping them at home. How should they act? How should they react? What kind of activity can they propose to the, uh, those who are interested in culture in general? The, all these were the questions. The, uh, virus situation brought quite a question to the uh, religious relationship because as we saw all these uh, holidays of Christian world of uh, now we're coming to the Islamic uh, Ramadan and I think that all these activities also brought us to the difficult understanding and uh, to the position to find out the solution, how to celebrate it, how to move further, how we will implement these uh, necessary procedures and re religions, traditional uh, activities during all these uh, difficulties through the situation. I just want to inform you that the uh, government of Azerbaijan was quite well prepared to the situation from point of view of the quick reaction to that. Uh, even in the, at the end of January, uh, it was special uh, task force committee was created with the cabinet of ministers according to the degree of the president. And moreover, 
step by step uh, these matters of limitations uh, brought the questions with the economy, the activity, the social matters. And this uh, task force is delivering every kind of activity, their decisions, their, uh, uh, I mean, support. A special groups were created according to the decree of President Ilham Aliyev, which is specially dedicated and targeted to the uh, support of the different kind of activities. And I'm, I can say that uh, government through the different uh, institutions is supporting the uh, well-being, let's say so, of the cultural assets which are within the state, but through the different commission which is within the Ministry of Economy, considering that the uh, creative industry in general is the part of the industry and business itself, is giving the assistance to them, supporting them, giving them loans, uh, I, I mean, uh, in prolonging the debts and so different kind of uh, economical uh, vehicle, uh, I mean, points which were bringing the sustainability and for, of the activity of these people. And I'm thankful that the government of Azerbaijan is according to the president's decree, is doing that also for the creative industries, because it is difficult to keep the people at home without, you know, access to the um, financial possibilities, uh, making them uh, follow up of the, uh, asking them for, to follow up the activity for the creative industry and so on. So, all this situation brought us to the, a lot of questions. From one point of view, there are some circles which are minimizing the influence of the virus to the general cultural matters and considering that everything will return to the previous level. The others are overestimating the influence and trying to put the questions uh, whether should this institution survive in general or not. It is really the matter of concern for a lot of people. And I think that uh, we have to think about our future forum, because we are the members of the task forum, to put maybe to the agenda or maybe the pre preliminary uh, preparational work, uh, the matter of uh, the discussion of the questions which this uh, quite unexpected situation brought to the cultural institutions in general. I think that the, this is the same, the same situation is same uh, worldwide now. Uh, the matter in Azerbaijan or in uh, other countries, in uh, other continents, it doesn't matter. Everyone is suffering from that and everyone is trying to find the solution to that. So we have to find out certain balance of the activity. We must understand, uh, I'm always applying to my staff, to my people whom we are working with and doing a lot of projects I don't want to use your time, valuable time, uh, describing the different projects, how to stay at home and create at home, how to stay at home and educate at home, competitions, I, I don't know, uh, to write the essays about the museums and uh, virtual musical lessons, which are counting for more than, today I can say more than 35,000 virtual lessons were done by the teachers of the musical schools uh, through the WhatsApp, through the Zoom, through the different uh, places. I'm not going to worry about that. But my consideration that the humanity and the cultural people whom we are representing today here at this task force, we passed a certain point of the return. I think that the vehicles and instit uh, institutional, uh, I think the uh, methods which we use now during this period of time already proved through this short time they are right for the existence and we will never return to the world where only the previously used methods will be living and those will be forgotten. I think that these methods nowadays are proving the uh, right to live with the after uh, in the after crisis world 
That's why we have to find the balance between how to use these facilities, these possibilities of the virtual uh, cultural activity, and how to return and restore the full value of the institutions which the human being created during the uh, ages and centuries. How the theater will live without the spectators. How the concerts, how the music halls will be without the spectators. And we must understand that certain period of time people will still be in certain consideration whether to go or not to go. How to act in this time? How to follow up this uh, balance between the virtual world and activity of culture for the virtual world and those who require the public, require the activity which cheers them and which brings them to the public's, you know, uh, picture. So these are the questions which I consider are of great importance for today. I'm again would like to thank on behalf of the president of the country, on behalf of our first lady and the uh, chair of the Haidar Ali Foundation, who is doing a lot of things nowadays within the cultural, uh, I mean, pictures, uh, picture of the uh, Azerbaijani uh, social life today. And on behalf of the government of Azerbaijan, what, once more would like to thank you for participation, for joining us. And uh, this time is proving that if our task force is still dedicated to the Baku process and your participation is the proof for that, it means that Baku process is the process which has right to live in further times. So thank you for joining us. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Jean-Christophe for his decision and his agree, uh, that he agreed to moderate today's meeting. He is the person who stood along with uh, Robert Palmer at the beginning of the Baku process a uh, long time ago. And I uh, think it will be uh, very interesting moderating uh, from, interesting to hear his moderating from his side. Thank you very much. And Jean-Christophe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Garayev. Um, Thank you for your uh, words of introduction. Uh, and also, uh, I think we are all very grateful um, for you to keep the flag of the Baku process and the Baku spirit, uh, the flag floating, uh, and to organizing and bringing us all together. Uh, this is a very timely meeting. Um, this is also a time of paradox. I'm just out of um, a webinar uh, with um, uh, a former colleague uh, of Minister Moratinos. Uh, I was in a webinar just a few minutes ago uh, with Hubert Vedrin, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, who in a way stressed an interesting paradox, saying that at the very moment where the whole world is retreating uh, inside our borders, for the first time ever in the history of humanity, everybody everybody on the planet is sharing the same fear and the same threat. So on one hand, we are extremely divided, getting back to uh, the borders and the, the nation states. And at the same time, we are all together confronted to uh, one major threat. And however, even so we are all sharing uh, this threat, we are also witnessing week after week um, an increasing and a, con and, and a very worrisome blame game, finger pointing, uh, and a risk of escalation uh, among uh, different countries or different parts of the world. And in a way, um, we can ask ourselves if there is not a crisis behind the crisis. In other words, to what extent the sanitary crisis will, of course, generate an economic crisis that will itself generate potentially a geopolitical crisis, but also a cultural crisis. Um, and I think that uh, in a way we are 
at the crossroads and uh, there's potentially two routes that we can take. On one hand, what will be the consequences of this crisis? Uh, are we moving from the social distancing that we are witnessing today to some sort of a cultural distancing? And uh, where, you know, there is a risk of uh, growing fear, growing threat uh, to engage with other and with other culture. Or eventually at the opposite, we may consider and we may hope, and I think this is very much the spirit of the Baku process, that this crisis will serve as some sort of a wake up call and um, generate eventually a new internationalism. Uh, so, I mean, this is what uh, we could discuss with uh, what uh, Minister Garayev has mentioned before. And uh, I, my role will be mostly to, you know, to be the timekeeper. We have a, an amazing uh, uh, set of uh, uh, brilliant minds, very influential decision makers. And uh, we have about one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask everyone to limit their initial uh, statements to about three to four minutes so that we would have time afterwards for uh, a conversation. So I have the extreme uh, pleasure and privilege to uh, give the floor first to uh, Minister Moratinos, who is the High Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations. Thank you. Uh, merci, Jean-Christophe. Uh, thank you, Abul Fass, for convening this meeting. This virtual meeting, I think it's very timely. It reminds us uh, how important Baku process is and how we have to continue to consolidate it in this uh, very, very critical situation in the world. So in order to be brief, let me just uh, go and in the line of John Christophe, what's uh, presenting the, the topic in this uh, way of certain paradox. Uh, I think uh, we have to take into account that this uh, crisis has shown is the first global test for globalization. And uh, unfortunately, in this first test, uh, the response has been a, a failure. The national state, the international and regional organization were not able to cope and to answer the challenge that this crisis has produced. Number two, uh, it is true what uh, Jean Christophe was saying. It's the first time humanity has been absolutely uh, in affected. Uh, people from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, nobody has escaped to this virus. So it's a humanitarian crisis. More than humanitarian crisis, it's a crisis of humanity. And I think that we have to take into account. So in this uh, situation, what has been the response? The response has been fragmented, has been national, has been uh, unilateral. And I think that we have to be you know, aware of that. So um, also taking into account what uh, John Christophe has said, I see, I, I witness, and I think all of us have witnessed two main tendencies. The first one, the one who we like, all of us, and the people around this uh, virtual conference we will support, is this uh, renewed call for solidarity. Uh, everybody, every day, in the uh, windows and balcons of uh, our capital are applauding and showing solidarity. And this solidarity at this moment seems it's working, uh, but it's very fragile. People who want to work together still, uh, we have to see how they will react the day after the crisis is over. And the second tendency, unfortunately, is the one who wants to really uh, reinforce this uh, kind of egoism. Uh, people want to defend themselves, uh, working for the same, soft keeper, we'll say in French, uh, trying to get the uh, mask, uh, the ventilators, and, uh, and work in a unilateral manner. So these two tendencies are going to be, you know, confronting each other. So um, as uh, Minister Garadiev said, what kind of tendency we are going to defend ourselves? 
in order that the next Baku process uh, conference summit will uh, have a, a agreed to success. And I think we have achieved and we have uh, seen from the UN perspective uh, several core or several strategy. Of course, it has been a very important and very, I, I think, uh, uh, needed a call for a ceasefire in the world by Secretary General Antonio Guterres. We have to support it. Then there has been a call and a global plan of humanitarian um, um, support, and we have to support that. Then we have seen a, a recovery and response recovery plan in order to come to the economic and social consequences of the crisis. We will have seen also food crisis, but I think um, we are being very active. UNESCO has been very active, has offered a lot of uh, possibility for everybody. Yourself, uh, minister said you have 35,000 activities. With UNOSC, United Nations Alliance of Civilization have maintained their activities in the virtual way. We have made several calls with Haddad Majan and other religious leaders. That is very good. But we should now start to think what is going to be our response, our attitude the day after, or already today, in order that we can prepare ourselves to return to what we can say normalcy. Uh, it's a paradox. During this crisis, uh, people that had been confined, what they had been doing? What has been uh, the two main uh, activities? Uh, they have eat, they need food, physical food, and then they have a need for cultural and spiritual food. And then never ever cultural activities, so thanks to UNESCO and to many others, have now benefit of uh, films, plays, uh, TV program, music, uh, books. Mm, so they need culture. People need culture. And during the confinement, they consume culture. The problem now is how we are going to maintain this productivity of culture. And I think both the United Nations Alliance of Civilization and of course UNESCO and yourself of the Baku process we have to be the ones who can maintain this interest for cultural affairs and intracultural relationship. So just, uh, just uh, one minute more about the Baku process and what we should try from my point of view to start to work. And I like very much what Minister Garayev said to find the right balance between what we are going to be, of course, obliged, and we are using today, we are going to use the next month, this virtual activity. That's very good. I mean, but from my point of view, it has to be an instrumental. We should not forget how culture is created and how we interact with the people because uh, the exit and the, I mean, sorry, the success of Baku process is because you succeed to gather 100,000 people going together, youth, intellectual, politician, working together. The Global Forum of United USC that we still, I don't know if we will have uh, the possibility to hold in fest in, at the end of, of the year, is also a big conference with more or less 3,000 people. Uh, are we going to be able to have this gathering? I don't think so in, in this situation. So I think we should try to start to prepare ourselves in order that we can really have, a, let's to say, how we will be able to maintain these face-to-face -face activities. So I think my dear minister, uh, uh, you should, uh, we should try to work in the task force in creating the condition for maintaining the face-to-face -face activities. I know it's very going to be difficult. I know it will be um, 
some imaginative and innovative uh, procedure, but we should try to do so. So you remember after the 9-11, we changed our habits and going to the airport and we have to proceed to security measure. Every time we have to take a plane, we have to take out our shoes, to take out our, uh, you know, the jacket. And okay, we went through some security measures. So why we don't start to produce some regulation, some practices that will have the possibility to maintain the contact, the human contact, because we are living in a humane situation. This crisis is not a banking crisis, not financial crisis, as Secretary General said, it's a human crisis. And so culture is the main element, the main, I will say, factor to demonstrate this humanity. So my proposal, Mr. Uh, Garayev, is that we will work in the way how we will recreate and we will be able to maintain this kind of cultural activities, the real one. The virtual, we will adapt, we will continue, we will develop, for sure, they will increase, okay. But we have now to maintain the real cultural activities that has been the one who had been always three in the, you know, the prehistoric growth till today, the sense of humanity. If we lost this sense of humanity, as we are saying, we lose humanity forever. So that is my proposal, and I hope uh, we can work on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. High Representative, uh, for uh, stressing of those paradox and also uh, the need to maintain, by all means, uh, the face-to-face -face and physical uh, engagement. Uh, it is indeed quite uh, uh, essential. Um, and uh, I'm the pleasure now to uh, give the floor to Dr. Salim Al Malik, uh, who is the Director General of ICESCO. Bismillah um, Rahim. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Excellencies. Uh, to uh, thank the government of Azerbaijan the president, the first lady, and of course, um, the uh, minister of culture and tourism, uh, Abu Fas and his uh, working team for organizing this uh, important um, uh, meeting. So thank you for the invitation. Indeed, as you all mentioned, that the humanity, humanity now is facing unprecedented growth and economic crisis pushing communities on the edge of crisis and possibly an irreversible aftermath brought by this uh, pandemic. And despite the uh, stressful service, these and, um, and, and upheaval could shed lights of hope uh, to let us rethink and visualize deeply different alternatives uh, different alternative society models where ethics, the human, and environment would be at the center of concern. And beyond a dynamic break with the dominant model advocating internationalization, globalization, we are about to reevaluate future and sustainable transformation through internal change, factors that are specific to each geographic culture. Change should henceforth uh, be contextualized and explored as local potential. Thinking and acting locally, impacting or interacting globally. So indeed, this uh, perspective allows society, including those of the Islamic world, to consider themselves and to be involved as a whole rather than just localized areas of activities, which are often decontextualized, uh, uh, supporting themselves domestically in autonomous and responsible ways allows ultimately to gain independent and efficiency over the long term, while producing impact from local to global one and in a variety of fields. 
So, however, any civilization project is determined by the potential and commitment of everyone to carry out such an ambition, behavior, and belief of individual are decisive. Therefore, the concept of time seems particularly interesting to analyze and invest in at, the, at this concept could play in the near future a major role in the sustainable development of communities. At ISISCO, which is the Islamic world of uh, education, science, and culture organization, we have launched a number of initiatives. We announced for the, an international prize award for those who discover um, um, either vaccine or a therapy or a drug for treating um, this uh, uh, coronavirus. We also established the ISISCO Digital Home, which is a platform that is loaded with educational materials, cultural, uh, cultural materials, and science materials. And at last, we have announced or we launched a comprehensive, an initiative called Comprehensive Humanitarian Coalition, where we are inviting many international organizations, civil government institutions, companies, and we really have received quite a good number of interested institutions that uh, became part of our coalition, which we will uh, announce on the names uh, uh, very near. So there are some suggested tools of action to foster culture inter, uh, interaction. Um, and in our opinion, one is to establish an observatory of cultural trends, make a strategic monitoring for the best practices and benchmarking, establish laboratory of sustainable future to support the process in the strategic decision-making, make prospective research and studies accompanied by reports, publication aiming at planning and helping in decision making, conduct forums through seminars, roundtable discussion and participative workshops, and high support to strategic decision making based on methodological prospective approach. But before I end, I would like really to raise some questions one is, are we really prepared for this pandemic, despite the fact that we, it's almost now three or four months from the time it started? What if this pandemic lasts longer and continued more than what we expected? Have we really thought, are we just doing what is today and forgetting what is tomorrow? If rich countries are ready or have become ready and uh, work it out, what about those poor countries? Africa is at the edge and there are many countries that are even do not have the hygiene products that are needed. So these are some of the questions that I, we have and I thought of uh, one important, uh, another uh, question is, do we have the resilience mechanism that to prepare us to face and cope with the pandemic and its impact? Uh, and I think the answer of this is questionable, but maybe no. We need new policies. We need new infrastructure, new practices, new decision, a new orientation that's uh, past the corona uh, is a, a new world. Um, last is we really also have to preserve the gains from this pandemic. There are, despite the fact that there are a lot of losses, but yet there are a lot of gains that we really have to preserve after this COVID-19 is over. Thank you very much. And Ramadan Kareem, by the way.
Am I mute? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, sorry. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Al-Malik, for um, sharing with us uh, uh, or presenting the ISESCO initiative uh, during this crisis. I think it's very important for, no to, for us to know about it, also for raising those essential question, and particularly, indeed, the risk of a, indeed a growing gap between a rich country and poor countries. Uh, I think it would be really terrible if this crisis would contribute uh, to even widen the gap between uh, a different parts of the world. Um, um, I have the pleasure now to give the floor to Anna Belinda Price. Anna Belinda? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, I was having a little problem uh, <laughs> connecting to the mic. Thank you very much, uh, Jean Christophe. And thank you very much, um, Minister Garayev, to have, uh, for having invited me once again. It's really a pleasure to see old and also new uh, friends and colleagues. And uh, it's true that there is uh, really, uh, uh, we have really written a, a long chapter together. And it's, it's wonderful to think that we will continue it. And, uh, and the fact that you have called for this meeting is also in itself an act of uh, resilience, I think. Um, uh, some of the core, um, let's say responses, and here of course I speak as, as, a, as a person who works in UNESCO, is to maintain the connections. And this is precisely what you're doing uh, by calling this meeting, to insist upon uh, the inclusion and solidarity and to keep the dialogue going. This is, I think, has been also UNESCO's response and, and thank you, Mr. Moratinos, for, for mentioning UNESCO in the last past few weeks to constantly uh, call upon our networks, create a new um, coalitions in education, for instance, make the make the uh, mobilize all the, the scientific knowledge we have and ministry ministries who are involved with science and research. Get the whole collective machinery going in an inclusive and and as far as we can forward looking um, way. As culture is very much in, in, in at the center today. I mean, many things many things can be said about these new movements of let's say solidarity and, 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 and collaboration that are, are very important. Also new investments in, in, uh, in, 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 in more open and flexible education systems and, and, also, um, and also the production of visuals and graphics and social uh, for the social media. So we, we are sure that the messages and the knowledge that gets out there uh, has been verified. All this has been intensifying over the past weeks. I think we're very positive results in terms of getting uh, the world mobilized and making us feel uh, together uh, despite the distances. Even last week, uh, I'm sure you have, uh, you are aware of this, that uh, more than a thousand people gathered uh, uh, virtually with um, Madame Azoulay, uh, artists from across the world in a, in a resilient uh, a movement called Resilia Art, uh, talking about their, their situation, which has been aggravated, as we also heard. Um, uh, by the situation, the cultural institutions, like you mentioned, um, uh, Minister, the, the museums, the theatres, the cinemas are losing millions in revenue every day, and many have had to let go of their staff, and artists across the world uh, are struggling to make uh, ends meet. That is actually what we call a, a cultural emergency. So, uh, so uh, to, to, to capture experiences and, and the voices resilience from artists, I think, is, uh, is, is really at the core of, of what the next step should be to the extent that we can know about them. And I'll come back to this. But, but just also to mention that um, across the world, we are trying to increasingly um, do work. I think in, in, in moments of crisis, art has a, a, a magic way of operating on the mindsets of human beings. And in times of insecurity, it is a very, very strong uh, tool. Uh, in, on, in, in this uh, connection, I also would like to say that very soon we can move into the second chapter of our collaboration with Azerbaijan and all of you uh, through our um, intercultural dialogue platform, where we are moving into a whole new phase. And we should use that probably also in, in thinking the next, next uh, Baku Forum. Um, also, ethics, our ethics committees are meeting and coming up with declarations. You may have seen the International Bioethics Committee and the 
Commission of uh, Essays of Scientific Knowledge and Technology come up with a very strong uh, statement last week about how to uh, include air circle considerations in everything we do these, uh, these days and our cities networks are moving. And Professor Fetty, who is here, is also doing a, a great work with all our, our uh, chairs in intercultural and uh, interreligious dialogue. But the thing is, all this, I think, is what we have to do and how we have to insist on not being fatalistic about what happens. But at the same time, isn't it true that predicting what will happen after the pandemic as we sit here today is very difficult? Not least because we have very little information about how long the outbreak and restrictions will last. This was exactly what you were saying, Dr. al -Naik. We We don't know how, last, uh, how long it will last. There is a lot of not knowing. And, and, and experts and, and our medical experts are the honest when they tell us that they also don't know. This, this uh, pandemic is some, uh, uh, the virus is something that we learn about as we go about it. Day by day, new information is coming out and there is no, there are other um, uh, pandemics and epidemics before, of course, but not this one. This one is new. So we are living with discovering it. And there are therefore uh, different scenarios, as Mr. Martinez also said, the optimistic ones and the more pessimistic ones. And the, 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 um, the solidarity is coexisting with, uh, with the increased uh, discrimination and marginalization of populations. I think, I think that one, at the, one thing that will be very important in, in, in building uh, going forward is that authorities will need to inspire public confidence to facilitate the recovery when that moment, co that moment comes. Building trust will require a very delicate balance between showing strong leadership and humility at the same time, and then acknowledging that we learn as we progress. I think this is at the core of, uh, of, uh, of uh, our, our, our thinking for the next steps. COVID-19, of course, reminds of us of our vulnerability as human beings and as humanity uh, at large. Um, but we have to maybe think that in the future, global health crises are not any longer what we would call rare events. We have short memories, we human beings, we don't learn so well from history. Are we prepared to spend enough on healthcare research in the future? That would be a core question, I think. And there's still an old question staying with us, which is, are we willing to pay a carbon tax to save the planet? So, so I, there is a lot of open endedness is what we're doing. It's important to do it and insist on doing it. And the more we do it, the more we will also reveal, I, I think. But if you will um, allow me to uh, emphasize or again underline the, the, uh, the let's say the, the fragility of of our situation uh, as human beings and in moving forward. I saw, if I can just end on, a, on a, an anecdote and I can come back with other things if we start uh, the exchange afterwards. But I saw, I was watching a very nice uh, um, telephone, uh, television program yesterday called La Grande Librairie. And I, there were several speakers there and authors and, and uh, philosophers. And there was this uh, uh, writer uh, from Algeria called Kamil Daoud, whom you, some of you probably know. And he said, he underlined the importance of what he called construct hope. We have to construct hope and we have to make construct sense, make sense of things. We have to insist upon this. Um, we are a threatened species, he said now. Uh, the, the, uh, Albert Camus' book, La Peste, is becoming a bestseller again in the world. Everybody's reading that book because it reminds them exactly of what we are experiencing now. Uh, people are also reading uh, Franz Kafka. Uh, the process, the, the fragility of human relationships, and the fact that in some of his stories, as you know, uh, things happen without reason. And this is, I think, a basic feeling that is, uh, we, we, we all can have. So um, the good news is that the current situation pushes us, and again, congratulations, uh, Minister, pushes us towards reflection. Everybody these days are reflecting, this group and other groups, and this is the only thing we can do now to more and more, let's say, uh, uh, take, take the re uh, re uh, position of the real of reality, a reality that for the moment is a little bit uh, escaping us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Anne Belinda, uh, for um, uh, those words and, and stressing, you know, the, 
uncertainty, the need to construct hope, uh, also the context of fragility and, uh, and, and uh, evidently uh, UNESCO is at the very heart of uh, all of those uh, questions. Um, I'm turning now to um, Professor Mike Hardy, uh, who have been during many years in the tireless way, um, carrying uh, the, also the flame of the Baku process, um, is the next speaker. Thank you, uh, Jean-Christophe, and uh, thank you, Minister. This isn't, isn't this an amazing team, you know, who sits down and around a table in this virtual way and is passionate and committed to finding the role and way forward. So many things have been mentioned already, um, the huge questions that we must ask, but we know that we can't do this alone and that we can't do it all. So I'd like to focus my three minutes on how we take the Baku process and how we, its next step and what contribution, what, what can we take forward into the future that's so uncertain, as we've said, um, and uh, make a positive gain. So I like the notion from Dr. Malik about uh, learning from our experiences, but you know, there are very few positives in the desperate pandemic that we have. The sadness of personal loss, the disruption to lives, um, the fact that a new normal has appeared without anyone's permission. We have a whole new way of working. My view is that the post-COVID world, if and when it arrives, will be for those who are prepared, because we cannot plan, and for those who understand how the world has changed. And I think, Mr. Minister, you started us off uh, today with those uh, those big questions. Do we really understand the changes that have taken place, that have, that have taken place without our management of change? Much of what we do now is on the back foot, is responsive to the conditions rather than anticipating new ones. So I think the world has changed in a way that will not allow us to, to, to go back to our past ways of working and our past experiences. We're in a new ball game and we have to be prepared and behave and adapt to take advantage of that new place. All the paradoxes which I shared, John Christophe, you started this brilliant uh, assessment and the problems we have, the, the uh, crossroads upon which we're at. Are we going to move forward to more rugged individualism of globalization or are we going to move into some sort of compassionate collaborative world? We have a choice. Um, and I worry that we don't have always the wherewithal to make that choice in the best way. The Baku process can help. It does convene influencers and decision makers. It can influence the way they think about those sorts of decisions. Three big changes stand out to me, Anne Belinda, in my reflections that have changed the world beyond any possibility of going backwards. The first is technology and our way of working. Spatial distancing is here to stay, in my view, all the scientists are telling us. Our use of the virtual and virtual media are here to stay. The renaissance of local networks, the only people we can do any relationship building with face-to-face -face are very, very local. Um, through closures that reduce transmissions, we're actually seeing some benefits. We've got clean air in some of our cities. I think those experiences will not uh, go away. We will want to build upon them. The campaigns of protest about the environment, climate emergency have been much more powerful since this wretched closure than it was before by open protest. The second, technology is my first change. The second is equity. Um, of course, we are all confronting the same challenges, but I resist the view that we're all in this together. There are uh, problems of unfairness and inequality. The uh, pandemic has amplified inequality. And I, I really fear how this will pan out as we hit the less developed uh, nation states in the world. It's raised doubts about inclusion. It's asked to build borders, not to break them down. It's raised big questions about how good we are at organizing some of the core systems for our communities. Our best understanding 
from all our work in the Baku process is that positive dialogue around human security depends on very, very simple basic systems that we as people globally should be resourceful enough to create. Our health system you referred to, the health systems that we have, many and various, divided and individual, are failing to respond or to anticipate these sorts of challenges. The financial system has failed to support the mobilization of resources and the protection of economies, as we shall see. We, talk, we could talk long and, and, and large about the failure of our systems to protect our planet. We can come back to that, of course. But finally, our government systems are failing. We're finding a real challenge in the way in which governance works globally. Do we go to authoritarianism or do we go to participation? Have we challenged which of these systems best suit the new conditions that we're now in? My third change is humanity. It's what I call humanity. So technology, equity and fairness and humanity. We have more evidence than ever that in the fight against this virus of the power of collaboration and the weakness of competition, of individualism. Will we learn from that? We've seen some hugely welcome things. I don't know in, in all your nation states, of course, we haven't been able to travel to one another and share. But I see in London here some much more moderation behavior, accommodation, a very short time we see better listening, people are hearing in discussions and our network in play and at work, old rivalries and heated uh, disagreements have become minor, trivialized compared with the major agenda that we're facing. So how do we configure ourselves in ways that meet our purpose of, of creating a better world, of trying to capture the positives that we want in the changes behavior that we observe. I think we have to be courageous and we have to think outside the pandemic. Thinking from within the pandemic will lock us into its power. Thinking outside is where we need to go. And I hope the Baku process could do that. You know, the best contributions are evidenced by context and content. The context is what we've been working on in the Baku process, the way in which we dialogue, the openness of our discussions, the creativity and the mobilization of culture to bring us together. But the content is also important. And I suggest that some of the content we need to facilitate is that around our failed systems that I referred to. I don't want us to grow a world for our future generations without a health system that works for all, without a financial system that doesn't drive people by debt, but drives people by enabling forces. And I want a system, of course, we all do, that creates security for our planet. And we want a sense of governance where we can all participate. Getting some of those system changes right as a consequence of the opportunities that this lockdown has created may well be that can improve the relations, the social relations that otherwise might be in danger. So how do we help people who have the influence and the responsibility to create systems that are fit for the new world, that are fit for purpose in this changed world, in the world that now has changed our technology, changed our sense of fairness and changed the humanity that governs our relationships overall? Let's do that in the Baku process. Let's create a dialogue around some fundamental changes that we know are taking place that we want to capture and mobilize in the right direction. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mike, for this very thoughtful uh, intervention uh, that is raising very important point that in a way could represent some part of the agenda for the, the work in the next few years of the Baku process. Um, you have also mentioned one very important point, which is about uh, the international architecture and governance. And uh, we should all have in mind that this year uh, is the 75th anniversary of the creation of the UN. Um, and um, there will be hopefully a very important uh, head of state summit um, with a UN declaration 
on September 21st, I don't know the, the status of, the, of, of this uh, project, uh, to uh, call and to present uh, pointers about uh, uh, the new international architecture. So uh, let's also have this uh, uh, in, in, in our mind. Um, I'm now happy, happy to give the floor uh, to one of the, the veterans, as uh, the minister has mentioned before, uh, uh, was uh, Robert Palmer, uh, who was at the very beginning of the process of the of the Baku process when he was uh, heading the uh, culture and cultural um, uh, heritage at the Council of Europe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jean Christophe, and also thank you. Minister for the invitation uh, to be involved in this uh, online online discussion, an important part of the, the Baku process. It's just extraordinary um, to listen to all of you um, and to think that normal life has stopped for more than a billion people around the world. And while as many people have said um, so far in the discussion, models and predictions for the future abound, no one can say with any certainty what the course of the, the virus will be, much less the longer term impact of the pandemic uh, as it will have on, on people and, and societies. Uh, personally, I can't really uh, comment on the intergovernmental cooperation, which uh, Mr. Moratinos referred to as being fragmented. But what I, I do sense is a strong development of a, a people to people empathy. Feelings of a kind of solidarity, as I think you defined uh, Jean Christophe at the beginning against economy, a common enemy uh, of the virus. Uh, the compassion that people feel for those who are more vulnerable and susceptible to the virus than perhaps some of us are. But we are uncertain how long lasting this will be. So no one knows uh, what will happen. Even predictions about next month uh, are difficult to make. Science doesn't really know since it's dependent on data and evidence. And there is no long-term certainty about this virus, whether it will return, how effective a vaccine will be, whether there will be other similar pandemics in the future. So we're all guessing to a certain extent. And the guesses or predictions that I hear vary substantially. There are some who believe that social distancing, although relaxed, will become the norm. How will we adapt to this, particularly in the cultural field? Some believe that security, national security, will become an absolute priority. So travel will remain difficult with everyone required to have a health permit before leaving their country perhaps with lengthy visa procedures. Security will come first in many cases, and each state will use all available means to protect its own citizens. Others believe that a major focus on national interests will shake confidence in uh, global cooperation. The fear of a new pandemic perhaps makes every local spread of a virus the trigger for more drastic measures, resulting in border closures and the defense of resources that a country has available. There might be a loss of confidence in international cooperation with recriminations, uh, aggressive threatening of countries that have not been able to control the virus, there might be increased international tension. Still others predict uh, a retreat into the private sphere where people no longer trust state actors and supranational alliances. There could be a trend towards small group solidarity 
that might become very attractive. My own uh, hopeful and more optimistic prediction is that world society will learn from this crisis and will be able to develop more resilient adaptive systems. There could be deep social and cooperative currents towards growth, which are driven by our collective uh, pandemic experience. We may increasingly believe that more than ever before, global risks require a genuine high level of dialogue and efforts so the world can act in a more globally networked manner. Cities and local actors could become more directly linked to global organizations so that local problems could be solved quickly and creatively and global risks could be identified and tackled cooperatively. Overall, uh, humanity might perceive itself more strongly as a global community that can resolve challenges together. But this will, and some of the previous panelists have mentioned this, this will require a fundamental change in values, solidarity, not only with our neighbors, but also at an international level. To turn in my final remarks to the importance of culture and the Baku Forum. Through culture, the very nature of culture enables experiences and viewpoints to be exchanged. We perhaps can understand difference better. Culture can be a space where we meet and learn to live together. Culture could be an important key to our recovery and the values that will shape the next chapter of our history. We need to continue to work together and the Baku process of, is one of many platforms that hopefully will enable us to continue to do so. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. Thank you, Robert, for um, one other very thoughtful intervention and also to, for stressing, you know, the, the sort of a new uh, way of living in uncertainty and, and, and the, which is generating lots of, of course, anxiety and, and makes things very difficult in terms of predictability. Um, and uh, also for stressing that uh, as long as we will be in this situation of this sort of uh, unlimited race for profit, uh, it will be very difficult to restore uh, the values and what brings us all together as humanity. So these are also very important points. Uh, I have the pleasure now to give the floor uh, uh, to uh, my excellent ex-colleague, uh, uh, Nihal Sahad, who is playing a very important role as a chef de cabinet and spokesperson for uh, High Representative Moratinos. And I have no doubt that this will be one other very rich and thoughtful intervention, Nihal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jean-Christophe, and thank you, um, Excellency Minister um, Garayev, for bringing us all together. And I'm happy to see all our colleagues that we have been working with for the past, let's say, uh, more than um, um, six, seven years, at least for me. I know that you all have been together uh, for much longer than that. So um, I, I will, because we are running out of time, I will make my, um, my comments uh, uh, very short at that time. If you recall, uh, in the next couple of days, uh, that is on the 25th of April, um, we are going to be celebrating four years uh, into our seventh global forum, which was hosted in Azerbaijan. Um, and um, the title was Living Together in Inclusive Societies, a Challenge and a Goal. And I think that this is the time to remember again and to recall uh, the title and to remember how important it is to be living together in inclusive societies and how challenging this is and to rethink 
the whole concept because this is what we should be doing now. Now, since the beginning of this crisis, of this human crisis, as Mr. Moratinos was mentioning, we were all uh, hearing over and over again from many people, experts, uh, leaders, political leaders, people like you and me, ordinary people, saying we are all in this together. Well, I would just ask the question back, are we really in all of this together? Yes, we are facing the, the same enemy. So we, in a sense, we are all in this together, but our responses has not been together. We have seen that despite the fact that we are facing the same enemy, but the, 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 the responses have been fragmented also as Mr. Moratinos pointed out, and they were fragmented in two ways. We had the response of the political leaders, the governments, and we had the response of the people and how ordinary people dealt with this crisis on a daily basis. On the for the political leaders, they were more inward in terms of responding to the, um, to the crisis than being outward. So they were inward looking more than outward looking for obvious reasons. They wanted to save their own political uh, their own constituencies and their own countries. But as far as people are concerned, um, people were grappling with the fact that, oh, we are not going to be seeing each other and we are not physically in touch with each other. The social distancing was their major problem. And then came another layer, which is how they are going to be making a living, um, given the fact that many people are losing their jobs. Millions and millions are losing their jobs because of the economic situation. But also at the same time, the, the difference between the people uh, reaction and the way they responded to the virus depended on two issues in my view. It depended on culture and education. The culture and education and the values embodied in the culture and in education, which is very important. And most successful responses have been from people who had very good education, who had inherent values. They know how to express and to behave in kindness, in compassion, and to show sympathy and to uh, refrain from stigma. This is people who had been raised well. They have a set of values inherent in them. And here I see where um, uh, the Baku process uh, comes into play. The reason, one of the reasons why UNOC was very keen on being part of the Baku process and to be a partner in um, um, with all um, the partners that we are uh, together here with is because it is fiercely aligned with what the Alliance of Civilization is trying to do. And uh, I see a golden opportunity because what we were trying to achieve through the Baku process, which is the promotion of intercultural and interfaith dialogue, the uh, importance of social cohesion, social resilience, and uh, the importance of uh, how inclusiveness uh, is what is going to be building resilient, just, and peaceful societies. I see that all these objectives have been taking a back seat on the global and international agenda. This is the opportunity where everybody is realizing how these values that we have been calling for are very important and they were very, um, 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 let's say, they were basic and essential in the response to the COVID-19 virus. In the report of the Secretary General that he launched a couple of weeks ago, among all other strategies that were launched by the United Nations, there was the, uh, his report on the e uh, uh, socio-economic impact of um, COVID-19. Um, and he pointed out to the fact that solidarity, our sol global solidarity is the cornerstone in our fight against that virus. And if we have this kind of global solidarity rather than individualism and tending to individualism, this is uh, the way forward. And this is also our opportunity where we should be uh, taking this strategy as a blueprint of what we as uh, partners in the Baku process should be doing in the future to 
to, uh, to enforce and reinforce the idea and the values of solidarity, of inclusiveness, of, uh, of, of multilateralism uh, that the United uh, Nations is standing uh, for. And I hear uh, many of you were talking about uh, individualism and whether the impact of the COVID pr um, crisis will be uh, um, people inclining uh, towards uh, individualism rather than multilateralism. I think that this is where multilateralism is going to be proving once and for all, if we are um, uh, successful in reinforcing it, that multilateralism works and that multilateralism is the way forward and that without multilateralism, we will never be able to survive um, um, individually or uh, in, 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 in um, um, I mean, in terms of states and in terms of uh, people as well. So um, I think that um, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to say, but I, I one, uh, one last comment about national security, which is what Mr. Palmer was uh, talking about. Indeed, the uh, current crisis is a national security crisis. If you recall, when the, the Ebola crisis was considered a national security crisis and it was um, categorized as such. The H1N1 uh, virus as well was categorized as national security crisis. You protect political leaders usually when they go somewhere from terrorist attacks. Well, they could die also of the virus. So there is a national security issue here and how you are going to be protecting your borders, how you are going to be protecting your, um, your, um, um, uh, your people, how you are going to be uh, mobilizing your resources because many countries have, have uh, deployed their military on the ground, leaving other security issues um, um, at stake. So this is something that we have to be grappling with as well. And I thank you all. Thank you, Nihal. Um, uh, thank you for uh, reminding us uh, the, this memorable edition of the Global Forum of UNOC uh, in Baku, uh, and in a way the fundamental principles that were uh, uh, laid out at that time, and uh, uh, reminding us also the, the importance of culture and education uh, in a way to refrain from stigma. I think this is, in a way, a very important element that we should uh, also keep in mind uh, the legacy of this uh, uh, global forum was uh, extremely important and um, uh, we should really in a way always get back uh, to those rules and to the fundamental principle. Uh, the time now is coming to switch to another part of the world. It must be quite late uh, in, uh, in Melbourne and uh, I have the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Professor Fatih, Fatih Mansouri. Thank you very much, Jean-Christophe. It is indeed past midnight, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep myself awake here. Thank you very much, Minister, for the invitation. Thank you all my distinguished colleagues and all the esteemed guests. Um, I think it's, um, someone mentioned, I think A.B. Uh, and Belinda mentioned uh, Albert Camus, La Peste, the Plague. What we need to really remember when we read the plague uh, is Albert Camus wrote it in the mid 20th century, but it was actually about an event that took place in Oran, the city of Oran, Wahran in Arabic, in Algeria, in the mid 19th century. And when you read very carefully the characters in the plague, and when you read the cycle of the, for that particular epidemic that took place in Oran, you will realize that things have not changed all that much in the way we normal uh, human beings, societies deal with pandemics or epidemics. It goes from the shock to the uh, kind of normalization of the situation, to peaking in terms of fatalities, to closing the city, to starting to actually plan what will happen when the, when, when the epidemic um, of, of that time took place. And there are plenty of other examples of how human societies have been able to deal or not deal very well with pandemics. And I think we need to ensure that amnesia is not one of the uh, all conquering uh, 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 values, so to speak, in this particular environment. What I would like to talk about, and I've, I've shared my uh, few reflections with you via email before the meeting, is to try to focus on few points that are extremely important in the way the pandemic is uh, unfolding 
and then come to some concluding remarks, which hopefully will allow us to look at a little bit uh, more of a positive uh, post-pandemic, uh, post-COVID-19 environment. Uh, of course, uh, COVID-19 has impacted the global society, both health-wise, but also economically. And I think it's because of that dual impact of the pandemic that we are witnessing really uh, changes to the way we normally lead our lives in ways that we could not perhaps anticipate previously. But one of the key problems that we are facing, and I'm working from home here, and my daughter has been schooled from home, and so everything has been uh, reconfigured in our daily lives, is that the need to combat the spread of this virus has meant that we had to rethink how we live our daily lives. So social distancing, restrictions on mobility, led to massive economic downturns. All of this have placed significant strain on individual relations locally, but also on collective international relations. Um, the, I mean, we hear and we heard it earlier that there are two camps in the way that governments or political leaders have reacted to the pandemic. And we can perhaps categorize them. It appears that we can categorize them, but I'm actually quite critical of this categorization, that we have the liberal internationalists who highlighted the interconnected and interdependent nature of our world, and that we need to harness these uh, attributes in, comp in, in really tackling the spread of the virus. But that's only rhetorically speaking. And then we have, on the other hand, the nationalists or the nativists, some people call them, or the protectionists, who pointed specifically to this pandemic as evidence that closing borders and restricting human mobility are critical factors in stopping these kind of diseases, ills, problems, whatever. Um, but in reality, in reality, even those so-called liberal internationalists have actually acted in exactly the same way as the nationalists, protectionists have acted. And if you look, for instance, at the um, situation in Europe, when Italy, in Northern Italy, was facing a, a devastating situation in Northern Italy, none of the 26 EU members have actually acted in ways that responded urgently to the situation in Italy. And then the Italian government had to wait for Cuban doctors and Chinese equipment and um, et cetera, et cetera, for things to arrive to actually alleviate the situation. So what we are seeing is what we think are two ends of an ideological spectrum are in fact coming to a very much a central position vis-a-vis uh, -vis how, how we manage uh, mobility, how we manage borders, how we manage these kind of problems. Uh, but we know that even in academe, in the international community, there are many who have always harbored what we call nativist ideology, ideologies that aspired protectionist policy and restricted movement of people and trade whilst rejecting globalization, and we've heard this earlier, with its emphasis on mobility, free trade, and interdependence of the global supply chain of goods and services. So this pandemic, at the, which is quite paradoxic, paradoxical in, in many cases, have also amplified the hollowness of the whole notion of borders, because the spread of COVID-19, as we know, it started in Wuhan, China. And I know Wuhan in China very well. I used to study there. I know the city. It's in central China, very industrial. Normally you'd think Wuhan is actually not very connected to major metropolis cities in the world, but the spread of the virus across geographies and across political and ideological stripes has shown that we are indeed interconnected in ways that we've never thought of possible before. So the risk that we are seeing emerging uh, from COVID-19 vis-a-vis our globalization in terms of an agenda is that these two polarizing ideological perspectives that in many ways are very similar um, will combine to make the situation even worse because um, th there is significant uh, negative impact on notions of multi multilateralism and transnational solidarity. And this of course would be a devastating shock to the international order that ironically, because of COVID-19, is in need of more collaboration, is in need of more coordination, and is also in need of more solidarity than ever before. Are we really envisaging a post-COVID-19 new order? It's a big statement, of course, and we've read a lot about this. I'm not so sure whether it will be a new order or whether it will be reconfiguring certain parameters of the existing frameworks. But it's precisely because of that that 
and I think we all share the same view here, that international frameworks such as the Baku process, but also such as those other values inspired by UNESCO and UNAOC and a number of other agencies within the UN family can play a very useful role with their emphasis on dialogue, solidarity, respect for difference and reciprocity and trust. Trust here needs to be underlined. One of the critical problems in terms of the political leadership, uh, perhaps response to COVID-19 is that citizenry all over the world had very minimal trust in current leadership. And because of that lack of trust in current leadership, it meant that the securitization of COVID-19 was looked at as purely uh, uh, very much a, uh, a grab for more power by politicians rather than a necessity to actually try to uh, restrain and contain the spread of this uh, epidemic. Um, uh, so what we, we, I think, what we will need to be looking at in terms of the intercultural dialogue agenda in particular is that the intercultural engagement will be needed even more in a post-COVID-19 international context because we need to deal with the problems that have been exposed and in many cases amplified by the pandemic. And I would like to just highlight two really important problems. One that's been exposed and amplified is the entrenched inequalities. And when we say entrenched inequalities here, people think inequalities only in, within society as in the low socioeconomic status communities and, and the haves and the have nots, so to speak, or the people who have citizenship rights and people who do not have citizenship rights, or temporary workers, international students, asylum seekers, refugees, but we also talk about entrenched inequalities in relation to the global north vis-a-vis -vis the global south. And you look at sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you look at uh, uh, the, the problem of digital disparities when we had to move to online and remote teaching of kids. Many countries in the northern, uh, the global north, so here in Australia, for instance, absolutely no problem. My daughter is able to have some meetings with her teacher and classes are streamed live and into interactions and all of those things, minimal disruption to the learning. That is not the case for more than a billion and a half students across the world, simply because they are not digitally capable to engage in remote learning. So that digital gap that UNESCO has talked about for many, many years has actually been now exposed and amplified even more in the context of COVID-19. Um, the other one that uh, we, we, we have seen also quite uh, recently is the re-emergence of ethnocultural racism. I'm not sure about where you live, but where we live in Melbourne and Sydney here, we have large numbers of Chinese, Australian of Chinese background, more than a million between the two cities. We have seen a huge spike in racism directed at Australian of Chinese background, simply because people are accusing them of being behind the spread of this virus. So the uh, what the UN Secretary General called actually the disinfo pandemic, you know, it's a pandemic of disinformation in many ways also has led to those kind of problems. Uh, so on a positive note, I mean, I said that these are the problems that we are able to analyze and we are able perhaps to shed more light on so that we can think post COVID-19 what the priorities will be for the, for, for the main international players and the main international agencies. And I think those two things are extremely important. Um, but on a positive note, and I think we really need to always look at the positive notes, and Mike mentioned, uh, sorry, Mike mentioned, for instance, the environmental, perhaps, dividend of this lockdown, and I very much agree with him. Uh, there are also other things that we have seen emerging, and they're very promising. One of these things is what we are seeing in terms of the online solidarity that has emerged across cultural groups. Um, we've seen it in local neighborhoods here, which are very diverse whereby individuals are looking after the elderly, providing shopping supplies for the disabled, uh, may, taking turns in terms of checking on the well-being of all the neighbor, of people in the neighborhood. But we also have seen some transnational solidarity also manifest. This is quite ironic because I was talking earlier about the confrontation between uh, the two ideological uh, you know, ends of, of, of the spectrum but there is also encouraging signs of transnational solidarity. And we've seen it in particular in what I'm referring to here as medical diplomacy, uh, highlighting the deeply interconnected and the deeply interdependent nature of our uh, 
globalized world now, but also of our post COVID-19 uh, world order. Of course, we have many examples of Cuban doctors flying all over the place or India sending a particular medication in particular to the immediate region uh, uh, of Southeast Asia. Um, so this online solid solidarity, this transnational solid solidarity is uh, telling us that individuals and citizens all over the world are very creative in terms of uh, building and sustaining new initiatives for building that social rapport that we have unfortunately lost because of the um, lockdown that, that we are seeing. Um, there are many things that COVID-19 is teaching us, but one of the core lessons of this particular pandemic is that there is no benefit to any individual, any group, any culture, any nation in needing to retreat and close borders and shut shop, so to speak, because the pandemic has shown that there is a very risky, but at once promising connection that binds all of us together. And it is that connection that needs to be explored through the um, trials and tribulation of trying to deal with uh, COVID-19. I, I will stop here, but you do have the notes that I've, I've circulated earlier, Jean-Christophe, and I think everyone else will, will, will have them. So, but I will stop there and happy for the discussion later on. Thanks a lot, uh, Feti. Uh, uh, one of the very rich uh, uh, intervention and, and also stressing again, you know, the need for um, international framework or international architecture. Uh, I'd like just to also remind that uh, I think tomorrow, uh, uh, April 24th, is the UN International Day for Multilateralism, uh, which is a bit ironic uh, in the situation where we are. Um, and I, probably one thing is, is to see how uh, this sort of consensus that we are developing here for more, more multilateral cooperation, international cooperation, how to put this message out there, you know, because this, this is obviously one of the big issues that we are confronted is that uh, uh, there is a, uh, not a, I mean, a tendency to speak among the converted, but I think one of the greatest challenge is how to uh, uh, amplify this voice of wisdom and to, in a way, uh, minimize the voice of fear. Uh, this is really a key challenge. And I think the Baku process can play uh, a, a tremendous role in uh, uh, not just uh, uh, raising the issue of the what to do, but the how to do it and how to, in a way, to build a world movement or a world constituency uh, that will understand indeed uh, 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 the need for more cooperation rather than retreating. Um, we are running a little bit behind time, uh, so I'm giving the floor immediately uh, to one other uh, real champion in the Baku process uh, and uh, our dear friend, uh, Deputy Minister Mamaya Daleyeva. You. you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. It is a great honor for me to be in this meeting today, uh, as I have been participating in a battle process for 30 years. I see here our great friend, Robert, who was one of the founding fathers of this process. Jean-Christophe, Mike, Nihal, and Belinda have played a crucial role in development of the World Forum on Intercultural Dialogue. Of course, participation of um, excellences, Mr. Maratinas and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Malik on this meeting also is an excellent proof of uh, their commitment to intercultural dialogue and Baku process. I mentioned uh, 12 years uh, cooperation within Baku process and these years, days, and unforgettable moments become our friends. The time becomes our friend. This process has been always about human relations, mutual contacts. Uh, I remember at the Council of Europe Culture Ministers Conference in where uh, the Baku process launched, Mr. Palmer uh, proposed um, 
uh, Arctic for Dialogue program in 2008. Unfortunately, this program had not been implemented, but today, uh, due to this pandemic, we see dialogue between artists in all over the world through virtual platforms. Therefore, I have a positive feeling about the future, about our relations and communications. I believe that technologies will create new opportunities of collaboration with no delay. Thank you once more. Thank you, uh, Minister, uh, for uh, this uh, very positive note and uh, uh, also reminding us that uh, uh, there are wonderful initiatives taking place here and there, uh, and that are a, a, a good hope. Uh, now, um, I'm the pleasure to give the floor to uh, um, the very brilliant representative uh, of Azerbaijan to UNESCO, uh, Ambassador Karimov. Thank you very much, Jean Christophe. Uh, well, we'll be very, very brief. Uh, a word of thanks to His Excellency Minister and his team for uh, organizing and initiating this uh, meeting, and uh, which really reminds us the importance of the people to people contact, uh, even in this in the virtual format and the, the dialogue that we really need in today's uh, world. Uh, of course, I would like to thank all uh, partners for. Uh, participation and uh, indeed uh, meaningful debates uh, which really give us a lot of food for thought for for our work and uh, in the, the in the elaboration of course the program and the concept of the next forum in Baku in 2021. Uh, for me if I would uh, sum up uh, the, the common denominator of today's debate is I think the importance of culture that the culture needs to be man maintained, the culture needs to be protected and preserved as a driver, as an enabler of, of, of resilience, as an enabler of international cooperation and dialogue. And I do hope that these uh, valuable thoughts will be reflected in, in our uh, further uh, forums. And uh, on a practical note, just a small teaser for all of you, the Paris is living its best times right now. The, the weather is nice, the, the clean air, uh, the clean streets. Uh, and uh, I, I do hope that uh, the, 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 uh, these conditions will allow us to host a physical meeting of task force in Paris. And I would be happy to host all of you in Paris. Thank you. Thank you, Anar. And I can confirm indeed that uh... We have a blue sky and uh, and clean street in uh, and very quiet street. I mean, we could even have a have a dinner in uh, uh, Place de la Concorde, which is quite uh, uh, unusual. Um, so now I'm giving the floor to uh, Vasif, uh, who has been uh, the, a key engineer in the Baku process and and bringing us uh, together. Thank you very much. Actually, it's very difficult to speak after all these great thinkers. And I would like to thank the minister his, to his initiative. And I would like to thank Mr. Moratinos and His Excellency Mr. Al Malik for their outstanding remarks and also our great friends. Uh, I have I have very short, actually, I, I point, uh, pointed four issues for me. The first one is the humankind is going through a humanitarian and social revolution that can that kind that had, had happened uh, three times before. The first is discovery of fire, the second was advent of culture, and the third was the industrial revolution. But now we are in the fourth revolution, which is the predominance of new technology and supremacy of modern means of communication. The second point is this post-epidemic stage will see the emergence of new human being whose daily behavior and thinking will differ from what it was before the COVID-19 outbreak. And it was mentioned by uh, previous speakers as well. So the legal, political, economic, and social system of countries will have to adapt to this new human being. That's a new generation of tomorrow. So in this new generation of tomorrow is not the same new generation 
before COVID-19. This new generation is without age. All, kind, all age is a new generation who accepts the reality of this post-pandemic reality. The third one is, uh, in light of this impact of COVID-19 on the individual and collective behaviors of society and state, the people's continued search for information. So it's necessary to keep in mind the post-pandemic world when it comes to decision-making. So all we express that humankind will soon live in a world that's very different from one the one before the virus, actually the world of uncertainty. So it's very difficult to predict tomorrow because of the speed of the development of the technology. So we live in a technology world, but it's very difficult to predict the tomorrow. That's why uh, we should have a solid collaboration between health service with technology, between education system with technology, between culture system with technology, economy, agriculture, and all areas should have the collaboration with technology. Therefore, for the back process, when it comes to back process, we need to develop good, very important and challenging communication tools for our collaboration. I think uh, we will survive uh, and uh, we will succeed uh, on this. And I wish you uh, all the best health and thank you for joining us. Thank you. If you, Jean Christophe, if you'll permit me, I will try to conclude. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> my thanks to everyone. Uh, my thanks for your dedicated participation. And I must say that all interventions were uh, very interesting from point of view, it's peculiarity because each of you were touching uh, the items and the points which are really reflecting the difficulty of this nowadays situation, starting with the political matters until the social, economical and national security matters, health system, the uh, potential uh, strengths of the guidance of the uh, processes within this crisis, A very interesting uh, wide scope of the questions which were raised today. And it means that Baku process had been grown up from the idea of the intercultural dialogue towards the dialogue on the topics which are worrying the human being today. Uh, from this point of view, I would like to thank all of you for the real understanding and your dedication to the matter of the dialogue. Uh, we suffer today from the absence of the personal contacts, but still we believe and we work for the return of the relationship within not only governments, international organizations, but between the human beings in general. And we must understand that, and I understanding this from your interventions, your proposals, your visions, that we are looking forward with the new hope that humanity will make certain outcomes from the situation and bring us to the better communicational system, better contact system, and better activity system. Because the result of whatever we are discussing today must be targeted to the answer uh, of the question. What to do, how to do, with whom to do, and in which time term should we act on different questions we rose today. So from this part, uh, I would like to propose the following. We have a think tank. And today we had very interesting proposals. I think that Vasif and his team, uh, along with all our colleagues, will uh, systemize the ideas which were given today. Uh, I think that we can already find out the ideas and logos and topics for the discussion and presentations of each of you under the certain uh, I mean presentation or the panels during the next forums. Uh, you must be aware that in October we are still 
thinking about having the other side of the Baku process. This is humanitarian forum, which we also have uh, in Baku. And uh, I think that we have to uh, find out which questions to be proposed there for discussion and which had be to remain for the intercultural development. And what is very important, that during this period of time, each of us personally, by the countries, and of course by the international organizations, we gained certain experience. And I think that this certain experience must be brought also to the agenda like a matter of the discussion and evaluation of this experience. Whether this experience should go with us further or should we forget about that because it is bringing people for separation and misunderstanding and multiculturalism is not uh, the matter of the interest of these practices. So we have to define it. And from this point of view, I would like to propose and I would declare that Azerbaijan is uh, fully supporting all initiatives of the international organizations, which had been done during the last 10 days by UNESCO and by ISESCO. We already published and gave full information about these initiatives to the white publicity, white public, through internet, through uh, announcements, through the media and so on. And we already have the impact and uh, recall uh, responses from the uh, individuals and organizations which are interested in participation, in giving some uh, additional, you know, uh, value to uh, Azerbaijan's position in these competitions, in these uh, strategies, in these mottos and whatever. So these initiatives themselves are the matter of reconciliation and re-understanding re during next forums whether these initiatives brought us better solutions for the crisis or not. Because with supporting initiatives doesn't mean that all our initiatives have right to be used in future. But those which were launched by both these responsible organizations, valuable organizations, are fully supported by the state of Azerbaijan. And we promise that uh, we will have quite an interesting proposals within these initiatives. So the initiatives themselves must be also matter of our discussion at the next forum. So uh, if you permit me, I understand that you today spent a lot of time with us. Two hours, I know, in New York, in Spain, in uh, Rabat, in, uh, I don't know, in, in uh, Melbourne, in Paris, in London, in Baku. We are spending time together for almost two hours. And this is really reflects that we are the personalities, you are the personalities, who are looking very positively to the Baku process and for the future of cooperation between people in general. So thank you very much. And I would like to ask to Vasif and all his colleagues and all those who will be joined to our, uh, I mean, uh, preparation uh, pro uh, programs to finalize, to uh, prepare the document which will be sent to all the participants of today's discussion and you will return to us with your comments where which will be uh, take uh, uh, took in the consideration and the final document which we will uh, submit closer to the uh, time when we will discuss the time of uh, I agree the time of the discussion of the forum itself on behalf of the uh, government of Azerbaijan on behalf of the president of the country, the, uh, the leadership of the country, we would like once more to thank all international community and all the experts who are involved in the Baku process for their high respect and for high participation in this forum. Thank you very much. And I wish all of you 
to take care about yourself, keep yourself safe, be at home, follow all regulations, and hope to see you in personally <laughs> very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Bye bye. See you next time. Thank you very much, Minister.